One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bite them. We shot the three Lord of the Rings films um, back to back over an 18 month period, but The Fellowship of the Ring was really the first one that we were shooting. <laughs> we were figuring it out as we were going along. I mean, this was a film crew in New Zealand led by me, and we had had very little experience doing large budget movies. I mean, it was a case of everyone just, just feeling like we were the luckiest people in the world to be able to um, do the things we could do. One ring to rule them all. The interesting thing with The Fellowship of the Ring that I find now is that it has relatively few digital effect shots. Films like Return of the King, King Kong or The Hobbit have got over 2,000 CGI shots in them. Um, Fellowship of the Ring has 550. So a lot of it was done practically. Um, the good old days, eh? <laughs> I always wanted to do the Black Riders CGI, the, 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 the horsemen, because I thought there would be something about their movements and their fluidity that would be creepy if they were CGI, but we just couldn't afford it. As it was, I tended to shoot in slow motion with sort of rather stylized camera angles because it was the only way I could make them look vaguely creepy. The scene where they are fighting the cave troll in Moria, we were filming the actors doing their part of the scene. Obviously, there was no troll there. And at that point, we, you know, we didn't really know whether we could create this troll. I mean, we'd never done anything like that in New Zealand before. It was our own CG company that was doing it, and it was very much um, in its infancy at that stage. That's my Ray Harryhausen scene, because I'm a huge Harryhausen fan. Um, and I, I, I shot the cave troll fight using much the same style and techniques that he would have, maybe the Cyclops fight in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Um, except I was able to move the camera around more. I was always aware that, that Harryhausen had to have very static cameras because of the, the stop motion process that he was doing. So I was determined to do my Harryhausen scene, but handheld. So the, the handheld nature of that um, fight is deliberate. I wanted it to feel very immediate and unlike any monster fight we'd ever seen before at that stage. We were shooting these movies and all that we were reading in the press at the time was the fact that um, it was, you know, an unknown New Zealand filmmaker who had been entrusted with this huge amount of money, that New Line were gambling everything on, on banking three films at the same time. And there was a strong sense in these stories that the films were probably not going to work and the studio would be bankrupt. Um, <laughs> which is, which is a, it's a motivator in actual fact, because when you're reading this and you're making the films and you're right in the thick of it, um, you just think, well, you know, stuff you, we're going to prove you wrong. <laughs> and it actually gives you, it sort of juices you up a little bit to kind of really try to deliver the goods. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bite them. We shot the three Lord of the Rings films um, back to back over an 18 month period, but The Fellowship of the Ring was really the first one that we were shooting. We were figuring it out as we were going along. I mean, this was a film crew in New Zealand led by me and we had had very little experience doing large budget movies. I mean, it was a case of everyone just just feeling like we were the luckiest people in the world to be able to um, do the things we could do. One ring to rule them all. The interesting thing with The Fellowship of the Ring that I find now is that it has relatively few digital effect shots. Films like Return of the King, King Kong or The Hobbit have got over 2,000 CGI shots in them. Um, Fellowship of the Ring has 550. So a lot of it was done practically. Um, the good old days, eh? <laughs> I 
I always wanted to do the Black Riders CGI, the, 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 the horsemen, because I thought there would be something about their movements and their fluidity that would be creepy if they were CGI, but we just couldn't afford it. As it was, I tended to shoot in slow motion with sort of rather stylized camera angles because it was the only way I could make them look vaguely creepy. The scene where they are fighting the cave troll in Moria, we were filming the actors doing their part of the scene. Obviously, there was no troll there. And at that point, we, you know, we didn't really know whether we could create this troll. I mean, we'd never done anything like that in New Zealand before. It was our own CG company that was doing it, and it was very much um, in its infancy at that stage. That's my Ray Harryhausen scene, because I'm a huge Harryhausen fan. Um, and I, I, I shot the cave troll fight using much the same style and techniques that he would have, maybe the Cyclops fight in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Um, except I was able to move the camera around more. I was always aware that, that Harryhausen had to have very static cameras because of the, the stop motion process that he was doing. So I was determined to do my Harryhausen scene, but handheld. So the, the handheld nature of that um, fight is deliberate. I wanted it to feel very immediate and unlike any monster fight we'd ever seen before at that stage. We were shooting these movies and all that we were reading in the press at the time was the fact that um, it was, you know, an unknown New Zealand filmmaker who had been entrusted with this huge amount of money that New Line were gambling everything on, on banking three films at the same time. And there was a strong sense in these stories that the films were probably not going to work and the studio would be bankrupt, um, <laughs> which is, which is a, it's a motivator in actual fact, because when you're reading this and you're making the films and you're right in the thick of it, um, uh, you just think, well, you know, stuff you, we're going to prove you wrong. <laughs> and it actually gives you, it sort of juices you up a little bit to kind of really try to deliver the goods. One, the sound of an approaching train, but it's not enough. An almighty crash in Texas as it slams into the stationary truck at a crossing in Midland County. Large metal pipes are sent flying into the air like straws, scattered, as reports say the truck was pushed half a mile before it stopped. The truck driver reportedly told local media he had stopped on the tracks to give way to other drivers, but had broken down and couldn't move his vehicle before the crash happened. He managed to get out alive. But 100 gallons of diesel fuel were spilled and a rail crossing sign damaged in the accident. It took hours for authorities to clear the debris from the Union Pacific Railroad crossing and reopen it. Two. A group of children took a slightly different route home on their way from school after their school bus crashed into a house in Texas. The bus was carrying 25 children when the brakes apparently failed, leaving five people injured. Two children on the bus, as well as one child inside the house, suffered minor injuries and have been taken to hospital. The bus was returning children home from Fort Sam Houston Elementary School when it crashed into a house in the military housing area in central San Antonio on Friday. A substitute teacher and a driver were also hurt. The driver has been hospitalised but remains in a stable condition. 3. The community of Santa Rosa in California is in shock after a 13-year-old boy was shot dead by police carrying a replica gun. The area where it happened is out of bounds, except for forensics to collect evidence, but events have already been pieced together. The teenager ID'd by his father to local media had been sent home early from school. 
He had then decided to take a pellet gun to his friends, but never turned up. His father said when he stepped outside his house, seeing police cars, he never thought it would be his son's lifeless body on the ground. A police report says two deputies had been on patrol, seen the teenager and repeatedly ordered him to drop the rifle. They then shot him several times. This is the pellet gun police found. They're often made to look like assault weapons. The death has prompted the community to ask questions and demand answers. One note left by a plastic gun, which was also found, urged drug testing. Even though he had been expelled from a previous school, according to friends and family, the teenager had a good sense of humour, enjoyed basketball, boxing and playing saxophone. Four. A group of men in London have violently attacked a foreign student, apparently because he's not local. This shocking CCTV footage released by the Metropolitan Police shows a gang of five Asian men smashing a bottle into the face of Francesco Honey, who arrived in the UK just three days before. The 22-year-old from Florida was on a night out in the Brick Lane area with a friend when the gang started to follow them home. It's not clear what was said, but an aggressive argument broke out, leading to the attack. One of the gang members grabbed a bottle Francesco was drinking from and smashed it against his face. They then chased him across the road, repeatedly kicking and punching him to the ground. Francesco was taken to the Royal London Hospital and had 23 stitches to his face. He now suffers from permanent scarring and said he's scared to go out in London alone. Welcome to Medical Breakthroughs from Penn Medicine, advancing medicine through precision diagnostics and novel therapy. For patients with cancer, the physical, emotional, and psychological tolls exacted by the disease, as well as by the care course itself, are often beyond measure. But new integrative approaches to treatment aiming to help patients better cope with and recover from the fight against cancer are now entering hospital settings. On today's program, we'll explore how these integrative therapeutic models are successfully being incorporated. This is Medical Breakthroughs from Penn Medicine on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Cottle, and joining me on this episode is Dr. William Levin, Clinical Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at Penn Medicine. Dr. Levin, welcome to the program. Great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So, why don't we start off, um, you know, can you give us a little background into the various ways integrative medicine has penetrated the oncology field in academic settings such as yours? Sure. Yeah, I think probably it's worthwhile to start with a definition so that uh, we're on the same page going forward. And actually, I'll paraphrase a definition from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, in their statement, they say that integrative oncology is a patient-centered evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind-body practices, natural products, and lifestyle modifications, along with conventional cancer treatments to optimize health and quality of life for cancer patients. One thing I did want to point out, and that is what integrative oncology is not, and I want to make sure that people understand that we're not talking about alternative medicine here, and that is to say that these techniques and modalities in the integrative world are not being used in place of the conventional cancer treatment, such as surgery and radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Excellent. And thank you so much for that definition and explaining that. You know, just to dive a little bit deeper into the current applications and practice, can you describe how integrative therapies are being incorporated into cancer care? Yeah, sure. Uh, recently, the uh, National Cancer Institute actually did a survey of its 45 uh, designated cancer centers around the country, and they asked them what were the most commonly offered services um, in terms of integrative therapies. 
And, you know, the most frequently used therapies were acupuncture, massage, yoga, and meditation. And this was the, the group that, of services that was utilized the most. And then the next most common activity that was utilized had to do with nutritional counseling and specifically focusing on the use of herbs and dietary supplements. Excellent. So from your own observations and experiences, where have integrative approaches to cancer therapy proven most beneficial? Clearly, the modality that's emerging as, as a real kind of workhorse in this world would be um, the use of acupuncture, which comes out of the traditional Chinese medicine world, and that's been around for thousands of years. And we just continue to get numerous randomized clinical trials showing a significant benefit with the use of acupuncture for things such as pain control prevention and control of nausea and vomiting as related to chemotherapy use. And then for um, head and neck patients, as I think you mentioned, I'm a radiation oncologist, and one of the side effects of radiation for the head and neck patients has to do with xerostomia or the reduction of saliva, which can be very disconcerting for patient. Um, Acupuncture has clearly showed a benefit for uh, mitigating some of these symptoms. Another area of interest here at Penn is the utilization of mindfulness meditation and yoga, and that that clearly shows benefit for stress and anxiety reduction as well. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is Medical Breakthroughs from Penn Medicine on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Cottle, and today I'm speaking with Dr. William Levin about integrative medicine and cancer care and the impacts it may have on the therapeutic landscape. So, Dr. Levin, we just talked about some ways in which these complementary approaches to care are making an impact in the oncology field. But looking at the other side, you know, where do you think integrative medicine's applications in oncology or other fields need more vetting or review before they enter broader practice? That's actually a great question, and I thank you for asking that. Um, Like I said in the beginning of our conversation, I want to reiterate that we're talking about integrative or complementary therapies, not alternative therapies. So with with that being said, to to be more direct in my answer, I would say the, the one area that we really want to be careful is when people are taking um, natural products and to not have a, a false sense of security there with that these are benign therapies that don't have an effect on uh, the patient's well-being or certainly that they don't have an effect on the efficacy of the conventional treatment. So, for instance, uh, we know that some of these natural herbs and vitamins actually can have a negative impact on blood clotting and certainly the body's ability to to clot is compromised when uh, patients are taking chemotherapy. So to add any of these other compounds on could actually set the patient up for a significant bleeding risk. The other thing that I would point out is actually radiation therapy and chemotherapy take advantage of certain cell functions um, that actually where the efficacy may be reduced by taking Um, these substances. So, for instance, radiation therapy utilizes the use of free radicals. So, normally in life, uh, we hear that free radicals are bad and we take substances, the free radical scavengers. For for our purposes, um, we are able to to actually destroy tumor cells by utilizing free radical formation. So certainly some of these substances that people are taking certainly could reduce the efficacy of our endeavors. Excellent. And I appreciate 